So as I said, I'm Eli, I'm a community manager for TechSoup, and I'm gonna be your host today. In today's webinar, we're gonna learn about nonprofits and how they can adapt their fundraising and development strategies in this uncertain and unusual time where we suspect there is inflation and a looming recession. So if you've got questions, we have got answers. We've put together a team of experts who will lead a discussion about fundraising in 2023. Um, so with this, I'm going to pass the baton over to Chelsea, who is going to be leading and introducing our experts for today. Thank you, Eli. My name is Chelsea Reichart. I am a customer success manager for onboard meetings, um, and I work primarily with nonprofits. So I am very excited to be here today um, to lead this discussion with some really, really impressive panelists. Um, so just to set the scene, um, we intend to explore during this session quite a few things. Um, how fundraising challenges and obstacles have changed over the last few years, how important elements of strong fundraising framework, how to address a decline in charitable giving, and how to engage and retain donors during this time. Without further ado, I would love to introduce you to our guest panelists for today's discussion. First, we have Stephanie Corey, principal at Stephanie Corey Consulting. Stephanie has dedicated her career to the nonprofit sector for 20 years. She has served as an executive director for a health advocacy organization, as well as held development and program management roles for human services organizations. In these roles, Stephanie expanded programming, strengthened infrastructure, grew fundraising revenue, and attracted talent. She is an adjunct faculty member for Villanova University's College of Professional Studies, where she teaches fundraising, and Stephanie is also a board source certified governance consultant and a licensed standards for excellence consultant. She authored a chapter on boards and fundraising for the second edition of the Handbook of Board Governance, which was published by John Wiley and Sons in 2020. In addition to Stephanie, we also have Eric Hanberg, the author of The Little Book of Boards, a board member's handbook for small and very small nonprofits. Eric has spent more than 20 years working with nonprofits. In addition to serving as the director of two nonprofits, he served as an interim executive director twice and worked with nonprofits in marketing and fundraising. He's also served on boards and committees for more than a dozen organizations, often in leadership roles and several times during a capital campaign. He is the author of four books for nonprofits, focusing on nonprofit management, fundraising, social media, and board governance, which have collectively sold tens of thousands of copies. They've been praised as essential reads for nonprofits by Forbes.com, LinkedIn for nonprofits, Kirkus Reviews, and thousands of executive directors and board members. Thank you both so much for joining us today. And for all of you joining us as well, we are just so excited to be able to present this discussion for you. So to set the stage, I'm just gonna go over a little bit of background context before we get started. Looking back over the last three years, the fundraising landscape has changed quite a bit. Development teams went from navigating an unexpected pandemic to facing unexpected inflation rate increases and a potential recession both of which have had a huge impact on fundraising. As a quick recap, in 2020 and 2021, there was a substantial spike in charitable giving. Lockdowns and restricted social activity left many people with more expendable income than normal. Combine that with a collective desire to help others during a global crisis, organizations that rely on charitable giving saw an increase in donations from both returning and first-time donors. As the pandemic persisted, there was a market correction in charitable giving. As the world opened back up, the public's attention and disposable income started to be spent elsewhere. Then, of course, inflation started rising, costs of living surged, and disposable income across the globe declined sharply. We saw small gifts dry up significantly and corporate giving decreased also. That brings us to today where nonprofits face the challenge of fundraising under these less than ideal financial conditions. That's why we brought in these two experts to help recalibrate our fundraising perspective and to also offer some strategies for optimizing development frameworks and strategies for our unique circumstances. 
One of the first um, strategies that we wanted to talk about was fundraising framework um, fundamentals. Say that three times in a row, it's very difficult. Um, for a topic and challenge this big, it helps to start at square one. Identifying and solidifying a strong fundraising strategy that is not necessarily recession proof, but recession resistant. Eric, would you be able to start us off with an overview of a strong fundamental framework for fundraising? Yes, absolutely. Uh, happy to take that on, Chelsea. Yeah. So it's important to, to think about um, when there's uncertainty, like sometimes it's good to get back to basics. And I am really a fan of the donor pipeline and the donor pyramid. And if you aren't familiar with these concepts, I'm going to give a high level gloss. And if you are, hopefully it's just a good reminder of like some of these key steps. So when you think about a donor pipeline, I want you to think about um, a cycle that we're going to take a donor's journey through. We're going to identify who this donor is. Maybe that just means that they're on your mailing list. Maybe that means they, they catch you uh, at an event and they say, hey, I wanna learn more. That's the donor pipeline. Um, next, we're gonna take those folks, the, the entry to the donor pipeline. Next, we're gonna take those folks and we're gonna start cultivating them by telling them more about our organization and the good work that we do. And at some point that's going to turn into an act. That might be, you know, at a fundraising event, we spend the first part of the event telling them uh, about how great we are, and then we ask them for money. Um, it also might be, you know, over a series of emails or letters over the course of a year. Um, after that, we're going to assume that we got a gift from this person uh, after that solicitation, and we're going to thank them. We're going to thank them uh, at, a, at an appropriate level. That might mean, you know, they get a letter the next day thanking them for their for their gift. That might mean for certain folks, a board member calls them and, and expresses their personal appreciation for their gift. There's lots of ways to thank them. And we're going to thank them by showing them why, you know, or how we're going to use their gift. We're going to tell them all about what we're doing with it. We're going to show them our good work. And guess what? That sounds a lot like cultivation. We're going to take that and move them, ideally, to a new level of giving by taking stewardship right back into cultivation and telling them more um, and asking for a larger gift next. And if we go to the next slide, one of the things that people are like, well, you know, where do I start? How do I figure out you know, who I wanna ask for more money from? I like to think of these three things, people you have a great relationship with, um, people who have wealth, who have means, and people who really love your mission. If you can find people who, you know, even tick two of these three boxes, you have a great relationship, and they have, they have means, uh, you have a great relationship and they just really love the mission, that is someone who might give a really great gift if you put the time in. Um, and if you have someone who has all three, that has the potential to really um, maybe even be a transformative gift. So think about these things as I move to this next slide, which is the donor pyramid. This is just a visualization of everyone who, who has given you money, let's say in the last year. Most likely, you have a lot of people at the bottom who give small gifts, $20 a month, you know, whatever it is, something like that. Maybe that's a big gift for you. Maybe that's actually higher up on the pyramid. Um, and then you have another group even above that, you know, in this hypothetical example, a couple of people who give 500 and maybe one or two who give, uh, you know, 1,000. That's a very normal donor pyramid. And your goal as a nonprofit fundraiser is to start expanding upward on the pyramid. So many nonprofits get stuck with those people just at the bottom, and they don't think about the strategies on how to move them up one level. How do you get the person who gives $50 at the end of the year to give $10 a month? That's twice the gift. How do you take the people who give $20 a month and get 500, you know, et cetera, et cetera. The more you go, uh, that's where the real rewards of fundraising come from. That's where there's real efficiencies. Um, and that's where you can really make a transformative difference. And I think that that's a really good place to close that uh, <laughs> fundraising 101 just thrown at you. But again, it is really important during these times uh, to be thinking about some of those basics. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, once that framework is solidified, the next challenge is engaging donors, which isn't always easy. Stephanie, can you speak to how simply not being afraid to ask for money is an important aspect for fundraising? 
Definitely. I think a lot of times we get so focused on cultivation that we don't actually get to solicitation. We're sending an e-newsletter. We're sending maybe a print newsletter, which I love print newsletters, by the way, because eventually someone will read them. They'll put them in that pile and they'll get to them versus that e-newsletter. Oh, yeah, I'll mark that to read later and I'll, I'll never get to it. So even a soft ask in those, um, in print newsletter, just inserting that remittance envelope, and it's magic. People will put a check in them and mail them back, especially if you have a direct mail responsive donor base, middle-aged and older donors. And, and certainly even in your e-newsletters, you know, that donate now button, uh, you know, letting people know that, you know, but we're, we're still accepting gifts. We'd love to have you make a gift, even without the direct, you know, ask that would be in a typical direct mail solicitation or solicitation email, but not being afraid to remind everyone that annual giving isn't just necessarily one gift per person per year and, and really making the case for why their support matters more now than, than ever. Yeah, that's, um, that's great advice. Um, another fundamental element we haven't touched on yet is leveraging technology in your fundraising efforts. Eric, would you be willing to speak to the difference that a fundraising database or similar tech can make for nonprofits? Uh, absolutely. It's really essential during a time like this to make sure you have a working donor database. Whether that means, you know, getting one for the very first time and making the, the switch from uh, Excel to a database or, you know, just really spending the time to make sure it's working for you the way it is. Um, professional fundraising means that you care about the next dollar as much as you care about the dollar that you just got. It means that you can go back to that donor and ask them for money again, but that means that you have to know who they are, how much they gave, when they gave um why they gave if you can if you can find that information for some of those major donors and the only way you're going to keep track of that is with the database it's so essential um and if you again if you already have one but maybe it's been kind of neglected a little bit because it just seems uh cumbersome this is a really good time to reinvest that energy into it because it'll really pay dividends for moving people up to new levels on that donor pyramid Great. Thank you so much for that insight. Another topic that we wanted to cover today is ways to address a decline in charitable giving. A solid framework is so important, but we also um, recognize that um, some strategies can make an immediate impact during a decline in charitable giving. Stephanie, can you provide some insights on how nonprofits can explore things such as planned giving and donor advised funds to generate funding during this time? Certainly, plan giving, uh, which is is often you know as simple as someone including your organization in their will, or as a beneficiary of their retirement plan or a life insurance policy. While that's not money that generally would come in today, because unfortunately we, we have to wait for the, the the donor to to pass away, but you don't want to stop your plan giving efforts because the time you're investing today will pay off in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. So don't neglect your future of your organization, your long-term sustainability to focus simply on current gifts. And you know, one thing you may hear from donors is, well, my portfolio is down. I'm not in the position to make a significant gift right now. Well, for your donors who have donor advised funds, or you may hear them called DAFs, they have already given that money away and it is sitting in an account waiting to be distributed to nonprofits like yours. Those donors made an irrevocable gift to their DAF and these are held at uh, community foundations, National Philanthropic Trust, uh, Schwab Charitable, Fidelity Charitable, a lot of the big investment companies have, have these vehicles. And the donor got the tax deduction when they transferred, generally they're going to be transferring securities to uh, the DAF, and the money is, is invested, and they essentially advise the DAF, okay, we would like to give $5,000 to this organization, $10,000 to this organization, 
and the organization uh, will sometimes know who holds the DAF and sometimes they it will be like the fuzzy bunny fund and you have no idea how to thank that person um, but if you do have the contact information for your donors that have donor advised funds you you definitely know that that a they they have money sitting aside that that it has to be given away. Um, there are not currently uh, rules on how much has to be distributed each year. So there is some concern with DAFs that donors have sort of hoarded money for a, a, a rainy nonprofit day and, and are not giving it away. But the minimum to, to open a, a DAF at most uh, places is, is five, ten thousand dollars But most people have DAFs um, with significantly more than that. That it doesn't cost them anything to make that designation to you. Now, I will say some folks look at just as their personal portfolio maybe um, you know got, have gone down with with the markets. They see that their DAF has two, and they might want to wait for it to regain some of of the funds before they disperse them. But you know, certainly it. It's not going to cost them anything today, and you know certainly again with you know, making the case for for support and and you know encouraging them not to be like my husband who's like well I'm going to wait for it to recover I'd I'd prefer to you know wait until it gets back to a certain point where it was instead of I tell him you know please support our favorite organizations now but um, donor advised funds are definitely um, a great way for, for donors to support you right now. And, and to have a sense if someone has a donor advised fund, they generally have some uh, assets to uh, invest in, in either a nonprofit, other ventures. So it's certainly someone that is capable of, of making a gift. Great, that's such great advice. Thank you so much for elaborating a little bit more on what um, those donor advised funds are. Eric, physical mail is another tool that nonprofits can leverage in this climate. Is that right? Yeah, and I'll second, uh, you know, what Stephanie said earlier. Abandoning your news, your print mail feels like a good idea because you're going to save the cost. You're going to save the cost of mailing and, you know, postage and paper and envelopes and all of that stuff. But the return uh on th those opportunities to ask people for money via you know a letter at the end of the year or maybe a couple letters at the end of the year it's really high it's substantially higher than email every so often you know there will be some social media uh hit that just you know really hits and suddenly you know went viral and you got a lot of money but you can't bank on that you can't plan on things like that what you can plan on is if you have a couple hundred a couple thousand addresses of people that you can reliably know that you know five ten percent of those people are going to probably give if you write a really good letter you make your case um you will get a much higher return that way than you will uh via email it's just it's just what the math shows right now um and it's it's worth continuing especially if you have those addresses um it, it can still be really important perfect so don't abandon that physical mail that's great advice Another aspect that development teams should be focusing on is prioritizing efficiency and ROI. What are some ways to inject efficiency in your overall fundraising efforts during this time? And this can be for either of you if you have any ideas. Well, you know, a lot of organizations think let's let's do an event and we'll, we'll raise a lot of money. Well, events are perhaps the most inefficient way in terms of return on investment to raise money. And in, in talking to development directors, food costs have gone up. It's so much more expensive to feed people a rubber chicken meal at, at, at the club than, than it used to be. And, and donors are aware of this, knowing that, okay, my $150 ticket, wow, probably after everything's said and done, the organization gets $10. How, how is this efficient? So events can be great if they serve another purpose? Are you actually raising friends? Are you engaging your constituents? But if you're looking at it as simply a, a way to raise money, probably not your most e efficient methodology. I'll, I'll chime in there as well. The most efficient way to raise money is to figure out, you know, using your database, who's at the top of your pyramid, you know, choose five people, 
get to know them over a couple cups of coffee or visit their home or bring them in for a tour and then ask them for money, like directly face to face in the same room. Is this a nonprofit that you can support? You know, would you make a pledge? That's always the most efficient. And for many people can be the most scary, but if you get over the fear, if you memorize your first line, here's what I'm going to say, you can get over the fear and you can you can get amazing gifts that you wouldn't have gotten otherwise uh, by uh, dancing around them. Yeah. So you have to pick up the phone, send a text, send an email, and and don't be afraid of rejection. Uh, I mean, it, people are busy. They're not going to read every email from their favorite nonprofit. In fact, half the people I don't even think listen to voicemail anymore when you, when you leave it for them somewhere. So you you have to not take it personally and, and be persistent. I mean, I've even had some folks say, oh, try 15 times. Okay, don't be that much of a stalker, but don't just call someone once and they don't call you back, so you give up. And and certainly the folks that that do respond to you and are willing to meet with you, they are a great group to focus on because they're interested in deepening that relationship. Fundraising is a lot like uh, baseball, seeing that it's the beginning of the baseball season. The best baseball players, you know, are only getting a hit three or four out of 10 times and your fundraising might be the same, but you're killing it if that's what you're doing. So think about that. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Seth. I was saying it's prioritizing the time to do that. So it, it's, it's, you know, ca- using technology to calendar, I'm going to call this person, I'm going to email that person and not just putting it off, putting it off because yeah, it's, it's uncomfortable to talk to a stranger, but hopefully you do know your donors, or if not, this is a great chance to do it. And especially if you're new at your organization, hi, I'm new. I, I, I see that you've, you've been a donor. I would love to meet you and put a face with a name. And you can do that for about 18 months. You can be new for 18 months. Yeah. I agree with that 100%. I'm still new to onboard, even though I've been here for like 14 months and it is working really well for me. So thank you for that. Um, Another really important topic, I think, and we've kind of touched on it, but I'm sure there's a little bit more, um, is how to engage and retain donor base during this time. Um, Engaging your donor base becomes more complicated under poor financial conditions, um, but it's still just as important to keep engaging them. Um, one way to activate and retain our donor base is stewardship. Uh, Stephanie, is there anything else that you can add to um, explain why focusing on stewardship is so important for fundraising teams right now? Well, you don't want to give up on your donors. Perhaps, you know, dispense, disposable income is down now, but they still love you. And as soon as they feel like they can make a gift, they will. So don't cut people off your newsletter list uh, unless they ask to be taken off. And, and realize that, you know, donors do lapse uh, where they haven't given for, you know, 12, 18 months, and they may not realize it. I, I, I find so many donors, you realize this when you publish an annual report with a list of names in it, and they call and say, oh my gosh, I'm not on it. And you talk, talk to them and pull up your, your, your data and your database, and it's been two years since they gave, and they're mortified because in their mind, they, they just made a gift. So it, it, it's definitely not time to, to cut people from your, your communications list, unless someone asks to be. And, and I would certainly look at uh, the metrics, your open rates for your electronic communications and see who's engaging and, and definitely not stop communicating with folks and, and certainly not stop, stop asking. Great, right. thank you. Eric, building on that point, can you describe how organizations can get creative with their monthly giving programs? Yes, absolutely. One of the things that we saw during uh, the pandemic was that, you know, organizations that had a lot of monthly donors uh, didn't have as much of a cliff maybe in the spring of 2020. Um, because people don't necessarily call the, you know, stop their monthly pledge. Like that takes a lot of work. They're usually pretty happy uh, to let that ride. One of the things that nonprofits have started to do with great success is simply like change their their donor, the donate button on the website to be defaulting to a monthly gift, like default that to a monthly gift with the options of $10 a month, $20 a month. And then maybe there's another tab that people can uh, can move over to if they want to make a one time gift. But just that default 
will probably start getting more gifts than you've gotten um, with just one time work. So that's that's one thing to think about. Um, another thing to think about is, is that some have created programs where they will um, have a quarterly uh, webinar, you know, for those monthly donors, just as, a, as an extra incentive as they're trying to kickstart that. Um, you don't want to go overboard with this, but, you know, just getting something where it's like, hey, this is something special for our monthly donors who are supporting us month in, month out. If you can keep it virtual, if you can keep it, you know, low cost, that's a nice thing to do as you're trying to build that, that revenue. Um, and, you know, I, I remember one fundraising event that I was at where the speaker who was making the ask uh, he said, give less. If you're going to give a hundred dollars, give $10 a month. You know what I mean? Like, like things like that. Like he pitched it as a way to stretch your gift. And a lot of people do respond to that. It's hard to, for some people to make a, a one-time gift of a hundred dollars, 250, um, but a $10, $20 a month gift they can actually uh, budget for. So it's useful for them and their, uh, pocketbook. They don't have that issue that Stephanie just mentioned where they're like, oh no, I haven't made my gift. You know you did because it's on a monthly one. Um, so you can make the, these asks. And um, I think that the many nonprofits, especially now that we have streaming and all of these things that we pay monthly for, people are used to it in a way that they even you know, 10 years ago weren't. So it's, it's really a, a powerful way to give stability to your, to your giving. Yeah, I love that. That really resonates, I think, especially with younger people who might be interested in starting to um, become donors for the first time. Being able to budget something smaller every month is seems a lot more feasible than one larger lump sum. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is that Onboard um, does provide fundraising support within our portal. Um, board management software can be very helpful tool for nonprofit governance in general, but also specifically for development teams and fundraising committees. Right now, fundraising and financial committees need to be connected and as collaborative as ever. Board management platforms like Onboard offer um, one central location for the seamless collaboration that is vital for an agile and efficient fundraising committee. And as a TechSoup partner, Onboard offers special pricing to TechSoup members in an effort to make our solutions accessible to nonprofits of all shapes and sizes. So if you're not already an Onboard partner, we'd love to be able to demo this solution for you and um, really talk about how we can make um, your board or your nonprofit even more impactful um, and efficient. So we do have... Um, a survey that we're gonna pop up before we get to the Q&A. We just wanna give you a chance to let us know if the, you would like any additional information. So you're gonna see this pop up on your screen and if you could just take a moment to respond. Awesome, I'm already seeing 56, 57 responses. Thank you all. Oh, Annie, I just saw your chat and I love that. Thank you so much. All right. Nice. We are at 75% participation. Go team. <laughs> Perfect. We're going to wrap this up in another five seconds. Thank you, everyone, for your participation. And closed. All right. So we are going to get to the Q&A next. Is that right, Eli? Absolutely. That sounds great. Let's move right into that. So, um, yeah, so we've had lots of great questions come from the attendees. I'm really grateful for everyone for coming in and sharing that. Let us dive right in. Um, and I'm going to start off with a question that I'm going to aim right at Eric. So here it comes. Is this a good time to start a fundraising event, even if we've never done one before? Um, I... I think chapter four of my book on fundraising is called Events Will Kill You. 
uh, which gets to the point that uh, Stephanie made as well. They're really hard. Um, events are great for getting donations from people who have maybe already given from an annual giving program, and you can get another gift from them in an event. They're also great for finding new donors. If you really don't know how to get new donors, this is a pretty good way because maybe your board members will bring their friends or something like that. You can get some new donors that way. But don't go into it expecting a lot of money in the first year, especially. Um, so if things are really tight, maybe it's not the year uh, to try to get this going. Um, but if you really are looking for those new donors or new ways to have your current donors give again, it, it might be worth considering. Right. So yes, but some caution is preached here. Awesome. Stephanie, you're next. What about donor acquisition? If we think we're about to enter a recession, am I barking up the wrong tree? Well, donor acquisition is notoriously expensive compared to retaining your existing donors. That said, if you have a very small donor base and it, it's not enough to support you, you know, what, what choice do you really have? And that's where I would be strategic with donor acquisition when you're looking at uh, mailing list rental or purchase, really having a sense of what the demographics are of who your current supporters are. So who your perfect person is and, and what more, what, who, who that person looks like. Where do they live? What are their, their hobbies? And, and, and really making sure you're being strategic with where you're trying to find new donors. But I would really focus on retention now because donor retention rates are abysmal, typically in the, the mid 40%. So I've got a quick question coming in from John, which says, do we ever stop adding to the donor pipeline or is this a forever project? Uh, it's always good to add new people into the pipeline. You know, you get email signups. That's someone who uh, you can start cultivating around that circle. Um, you'll get people who, who self-identify by writing you a check. You didn't even know who they were. And they're like, here I am. I'm a donor. Here's the check. That's a great, great way to bring them into the pipeline. But it doesn't stop uh, in the sense that, like, you're always thinking about a donor. You know, they're just given. Now I need to thank them. Or it's been a few months. Now I need to start cultivating for the next one. And hopefully it's not just a circle. Hopefully you're not treading water. I want you to imagine if I can illustrate it like a virtuous cycle that's going up and up. That's what you want to see uh, with that donor pipeline is keep the structure, just keep moving people up it. So speaking of these models, I've got a question here coming in from the Boston Museum who says, I love these ideas around the donor pyramid and the pipeline model but I've got a smaller community of about 3,000-ish members. Are these models appropriate to a smaller community or is there sort of a cutoff? I, I will say, I don't think that there's any, that there's any cutoff. Um, even the smallest nonprofit probably has 20 people who give a little bit and one person at the top of their small pyramid. Um, the pyramid works, the, the pipeline works. Um, it's, you know, sometimes fundraising is one of those things where it's like there's always a new idea. There's always a new idea. And sometimes just sticking to to some basic models will actually help uh, save you time because you're not going off and trying things, uh, you know, shiny object syndrome. Mm. Um, you can really just focus on here's my plan. I'm going to cultivate them. I'm going to ask and then I'm going to steward them. Uh, I'm going to take my pyramid and I'm going to try to move these people up one level. It, it, it works. Sweet. Now let's go deeper into donor advised funds. There's a couple questions there. So the first question comes from Elizabeth, which is to say, this is a really exciting opportunity. Is there a, like a publicly available list of donor advised funds or is this all sort of hidden away information? Well, it's, it's not like private foundations that have to file a 990 and you can use um, search capabilities or go to the IRS website to, to find them. The reason some people choose a donor advised fund is for that level of privacy. Other people, because it's more efficient. Uh, if you have, and I hate to say this, like only a million dollars to invest in a foundation, it wouldn't be efficient to create your own 501c3. Now that said, a lot of times community foundations in their annual reports or on their websites do list new fund donors they have. Now, sometimes people give their funds weird names. You're not going to know who it is, 
For other times it might be the Stephanie Corey Fund. So if you can figure out how to reach me, you could uh, potentially approach me. And, and certainly um, paying attention to how checks, you know, how you receive money from your donors, definitely noting in your donor database, this came through a donor advised fund. So you know who to reach out to. And I will say that some of the, the bigger organizations really do a lot of outreach. Once they receive one gift from a donor advised fund, they are direct mailing you to death because my husband does have one and I won't name the name of the national um, children's um, hospital type thing. Um, we get a letter every month now. So I, let's I, talk then about <laughs> some best practices around that. Cause my follow-up question from an anonymous member here is what are some of the ways you would recommend for, for actually working with and, and building a relationship with people who are administering these donor advised funds? Well, there are two differences there. So there's the don the the donor who is sort of you know the, the one who decides that you know we hear. So I donated the money. I'm I'm the um, why am I blanking on the? We wouldn't call him a trustee. I'm, I'm the successor, so I don't get to control our families. One my is after my husband passes away that but I get to start you know make it because he knows I'm going to give it all away in like one big gift. That that's the problem. <laughs> Um, but so there's like the, the Charles Schwab that the donor goes and says, okay, I want a thousand dollars to go to my local humane society. So, you know, certainly a relationship, you know, it'd be very hard to have a relationship with, you know, Charles Schwab or what have you, but with your local community foundation, you could certainly get to know the staff because believe it or not, some people have donor advice funds and don't know who they want to give their money to because they haven't been philanthropic yet and they don't have their their pet causes so it's it's being known to them so if they have a donor that says yeah you know I have all my money sitting there I kind of like animals do you know anyone who works with animals so that so there's that and and I would treat the donor advised fund donors like you would a you know an individual donor because we get these letters addressed to dear advisors at the Boris Family Fund I'm thinking okay um, you could just use our names because we do release our names so we're being treated like we're this big foundation when it was a one time memorial gift so it's a little off putting so I, I would general I, I would typically try to be at, as personal as possible with with your your donor advised fund donors and treat them like the individuals they are, not some huge corporate foundation. Sometimes I would recommend uh, if you don't if you don't have any relationship at all with your community foundation in your area, find out if you have one, get on their newsletter, apply for their grants. They as Stephanie said they often hold those donor advised funds. And if the if the the staff there knows about you um, because hey you got this gift from them. Um, Sometimes they can let one of their donors know, hey, there's this organization doing really good work. Um, you know, you, there, there's, there's benefits to being part of your community foundation's network anyway, but um, sometimes you, you might get a, get a surprise gift from, from the, their recommendations. Nice. Let's go a little bit meta. So someone actually has a question about major gift donors and Zoom. So do you think that Zoom has a role to play in meeting with donors? Or do you think really because these are high touch relationships, this should only like these larger gifts should only be asked for in person? I would say this depends on your donor's preference in geography. I don't think your donor wants to see their gift spent on you flying all the way from South Florida to Anchorage to ask them for a gift when that's the only reason you would be in Alaska. It wouldn't be, oh, I'm visiting a bunch of people. Can I pop in and see you in three weeks? So especially if you're an environmental organization where, you know, that that's what you're trying to fight against is, is, is climate change and certainly donors comfort level. Some people are still really concerned about COVID and, and don't necessarily want to get close to someone they don't know. I, I would, would give that as, as, as an option to donors. I'd love to meet with you. What, what is convenient for you? Certainly in person is the best, but um, you know, Zoom is certainly better than an email, a text over the phone. I, I, I will second all of that. Donors, donors, many donors still prefer it. And uh, it, it saves a lot of time on everyone. And if that's what they like, stick with the donor's preference. 
Great. So here's a bit of a question around monthly giving. Um, and it's about, you know, the dance between how often should we be reaching out to people versus every time we ask, we reach out to someone, we are then basically saying, oh, it's a chance for me to cancel my monthly recurring donation. Um, and so is there any advice on just like, how do we find that balance point between stewarding these people in monthly donor relationships, but knowing that every time we reach out to them, we also have this risk tied into it? I think you, you don't want to not include monthly donors in, in, in your solicitations. Now, I, I, I would probably limit the number of solicitations. Like if I'm not a monthly donor and you send me seven, maybe if I'm a monthly donor, you don't send me all seven. But definitely, you know, don't exclude your monthly donors from your communications. You know, you, yeah. they, they shouldn't just hear from you when you send them a tax receipt at, at the end of the year. Absolutely. Um... They need to know what you're doing. I think that the real question is like, when do you, you know, how often do you have news? How often can you share? Um, most likely, uh, you know, you can sustain a monthly or a bi-monthly newsletter. Um, you may not be able to do weekly, although honestly, um, if you have things happening that frequently, um, maybe they want to hear from you. And you know, if there really is something interesting, exciting, uh, newsworthy that's happening regularly, like don't don't necessarily hesitate to send them. Um, people want to hear good things. They want to hear about the good work that you're doing. Um, and that'll be motivating for them. Smart. I actually have two questions that have just popped in around community foundations. And the question is, is there a clearinghouse? How do I find my local community foundations? I say that if your location is enabled on your browser and you type in community foundation, your local one should probably show up. Um, and, and I could, I would say, you know, you could also start by, you know, whatever town you live in or state you live in, uh, like I'm in Delaware. So we have the Delaware community foundation, but then in the greater Philadelphia area, each County has their own. Plus there's the Philadelphia foundation that covers uh, the, the five County region. And, and I realized that if you're living in a more rural area, you know, it might be by the state or maybe a few states together, um, but I would, would, would certainly just, you know, do that type of, of, of search. And if you're a national organization, certainly a lot of that community foundations to, to try to build relationships with, but maybe focusing on those in, in the area where a lot of your donors seem to be. Community right. foundations can be great for other things too. You can, you know, if you uh, get a donor who says, hey, I'm interested in setting up a plan gift with you and you have no idea where to go, your local community foundation might have some resources and ideas. If you have the opportunity to have a endowment, they might be able to help um, administer that for you. They, they, they are resources to nonprofits in a variety of ways, not just as donors. Um, and they're, they're worth researching your city, state and, and county um, and see who's around you. That's a really good point, because if uh, you know, a donor comes to you and says, you know, I want to do a charitable gift annuity, and you're like, are we even qualified? How do we do that? Your local community foundation can do that for you. You don't get to keep all of the money because they have to, to stay in existence, but that's how you can certainly help donors facilitate more complicated gifts. Absolutely. Right. Here's a question around the acquisition side of things and purchase list. Um, so Jessica writes, in this age where data privacy is a big concern for many people and the laws are constantly getting tighter, what are the current thoughts around purchasing mailing lists? Is, is that like a reputational risk for an organization? Like, or is it something that we should still consider pursuing? Well, I guess I would argue, where else are you going to find, how else are you going to reach out to people you don't know? And with that, we're talking primarily about like a, a snail mail list. But the problem is a lot of those are based on people's magazine subscriptions. And I don't know about you, but I get a lot fewer magazines now that, that come in print. Uh, so I, therefore, I don't subscribe because I, I love print. Um, and, you know, the other option, and again, I, I, I don't know they would actually does this, but if you look at the fundraising literature, organizations trade lists. And I, I'm sure if I could see your faces, I'd see looks of what? Uh, but, but I'm sure Eric, yep, that literature says consider trading your list with, with other organizations. 
And, and certainly um, what you're get and what you're really getting when with the list is you're just getting names and addresses. And and, and you're, it's not um, I, I don't I'm not aware of how to purchase like email lists and, and then we're talking about like spam and and all kinds of things, but also making it easy for people to to opt out of solicitations. So making you know include for any of your donors actually in your direct mail solicitations giving instructions for opting out of your list so they can control. I, I, will, I will add that in, in my experience, purchasing lists is, um, uh, it works at a scale that really is like a large nonprofit thing and a lot of small nonprofits just, just can't make it work. It, it requires a lot of follow-up, moving people up the pyramid. It's, it's a big task to really make it work. If you're a small nonprofit, I'm not sure I would ex explore that uh, heavy cost, uh, you might consider, and even instead of trading, I do know some organizations, you know, the three community theaters in my town um, support each other in the sense of like, they tell each other, hey, here's the shows happening at this other theater, um, because they know that if people support theater in general, that's good for all of them. They're not trading their list. They're just supporting each other in some ways. It's an abundance mindset. And sometimes you might find an organization that is willing to participate in some way with an abundance mindset and share you you each share each other's news or or hey go find out what they're doing um but a lot of people do kind of want to hoard it and they get worried so it's going to depend on 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 your organization whether you want to actually trade whether you just want to support each other um yeah right so there's a couple ways to come at that both you know the explicit list trade and then these partnership models which don't necessarily get you into like some of these other data sharing issues. So I've got a question here um, from Barbara, who basically has got a bit of a, of a case study around diversifying funding. Um, so Barbara says, you know, we just lost a major foundation grant and a major government grant, both of which have been long time, you know, annual general operating support, it's like anchors. Um, how do you suggest that an organization that has this big gap in their in their funding all of a sudden start going and building like a diversified new funding pool? This is actually an, an opportunity. A lot of times donors think, oh, well, nonprofits are all funded by grants and, and government funding is to communicate with your donors hey, we need you as individuals now more than ever. And, and also exploring opportunities perhaps with, with other foundations in your area, doing research um, and, and seeing who you could develop relations with because relationships with, because foundations are in the business of giving away money regardless of um, if, if there is a recession. Yeah. Um, sometimes you can you can do those research. You can you can find someone who is a grant writer who has you know access to a database of foundations and grant opportunities. And you might you know it might be worth contracting with that person to help you identify new grants or foundations. Going back to the donors is always you know where my head goes to as well. Just like just like Stephanie, you know, asking your donors, hey, we we lost this big grant. We're working on it. Can you help us fill the gap? Um, don't ask you know don't don't it's not a hair on fire moment people uh respond poorly to panic mm -hmm. um you gotta be you you can ask to be saved once uh, uh and so you don't want to you don't want to say save us save us you know every six months um so if if there's a gap you can talk about the gap you can talk about the importance of the service um but it's not a panicked uh vibe that you want to be giving off either right it's, exactly. it's an opportunity to really see, not engage emerging. your people yeah Urgency, not emergency. I love that. <laughs> that should be the mantra for all of us. I'm going to print it up and put it above my desk. So uh, I've got a, a, one of those perennial questions here on the marketing side of things, which is when I'm starting to put together my newsletters, how long should it typically be? Or am I going to try and put my organization's full story in there, create a 20-page monster? Or do I want to pick like those top two stories or somewhere in between? How do I figure out what length works for my organization? I think part of it is, you know, can you get it out consistently? 
I would rather see a short newsletter go out with regularity versus some big long magazine that comes out sporadically. And, and thinking about what you can support in terms of staffing, as well as your budget for, you know, if we're talking about a, a print newsletter. And also people have short attention spans, so don't make them read multi-page articles. So I'd go with short, sweet, and consistent. I like to think about features, you know, like, like we have a place for a volunteer of the month. We have a place for, uh, here's a, you know, here's a heartwarming story. Like what are the three things you're gonna put in the newsletter and how frequently can you get three things? Um, and if you can do that, whatever the frequency is and, and stick to it, that's going to be a, a win. Love it. Yeah. But to me, I think that yeah, consistency is, is so important. Um, so I've got something coming in from Adam, who is, uh, is has a question about qualified charitable distributions. And Adam says, we're looking into trying to utilize qualified distrib charitable distributions, um, but we're not really quite sure the best way to get started. Should we create a website page with the information? Should we message donors over a certain age? What are some best practices around that? Well, why don't we just clarify what a qualified charitable distribution is for, for anyone that's not familiar with that. That's the official term for what you may have heard, um, a um, charitable IRA rollover. So that is essentially anyone that is subject to the required minimum distributions. Um, and actually, even though that age has changed, it's still age 70 and a half for this, where they can make gifts directly to a 501c3 nonprofit from their IRA, not their 401k, their IRA, and not, they don't get a tax deduction, but they also don't get taxed on that distribution that the IRS is, is making them take anyway. And, and I would say certainly put that information on your website, or that's a great newsletter article. And, and I would certainly focus the communications on your donors that, that are in that age group. And, and also, if you are seeing gifts come in that way, know that, well, my goodness, that person doesn't need their retirement income. It's clearly disposable income. So what a great prospect to, to deepen your relationship with. I think it is okay to segment too. If you do happen to know certain things about age or things like that, it's worth uh, it's worth sending it to those folks who you know would be, you know, roughly qualified in it. Um, you don't want to to waste the time of of someone who is 30 years out from this, you know, from necessarily putting it in their inbox. So if you have it, you know, consider it. If you have that data, consider segmenting. Awesome. That sounds great. We are moving towards the end of this really quickly. We probably have time for one or two final questions. So. If you haven't yet, throw your question into the Q&A and we'll have a chance to address that before we part and lose direct access to this trio of very smart people. So uh, I've got a question here um, from Melavika who asks, how do you deal with donors changing priorities and focuses post pandemic? How do you balance that tension between pivoting to secure funding from say historic donors you enjoy working with and maintaining your own independence. So not getting captured or have your mission diluted. So I think it's often a question of how much should we pursue the money that's out there, but worry a little bit about mission creep versus stick to the mission. I, I will I will say that, um, you know, all of our lives were upended in, in some way and we have to, except that like people's, people's worldviews really did change and we may not be able to, to you know, claw them back um, in every single case. Um, you know, if you're trying to force something, I think, I think it's easier to think about the people whose worldviews changed you know, in your favor. Where are the people who came away thinking like, I wanna support you um, and trying to find them. If someone has moved away because their, their focus has changed, um, Maybe you can get much smaller gifts from them and keep them around and keep keep them going, but it's possible that um, that they've just moved on, and and that is the way of of, of large donors, especially with what we've just been through, um, unfortunately. 
you know, you, you have to focus on, on, on your audience and, and, and not chase folks that, that are no longer interested. But again, just because they, they miss a year in their giving doesn't mean stop communicating with them. Absolutely. Fabulous. And now we're going to move into our final question coming in from Donna, um, who's really been talking about listening to us talk about how grants are really used often for restricted, specific projects. Um, if an organization is new to working on grant proposals, what is the first thing you should really start thinking about as you bring on this new kind of fundraising to your organization? Well, I would say this is where I often see mission creep because you have organizations that see, oh, this foundation is interested in funding X. We do Y, that's sort of close enough to X and we can just really shoehorn that in there and it'll be a match. So I, I think really staying true to what you're doing and looking for funders that, that are interested in that, not changing what you're doing to, to try to attract funders. And, and, and really thinking about what they're interested in, whether it is specific programs or it, it's capital or they're only interested in funding new projects and, and really having those conversations with funders. Many of them would rather have a quick phone call with you than have to read through your proposal and send you a rejection because it was never anything they'd be interested in. Keep an eye out for for buzzwords too. You know, like if if you see a grants for capacity building, if you see grants for words um, that you don't know what they quite mean by that, hundred percent, call them up, find out what that means. Um, maybe you have something that fits, maybe you don't, and it's better to not waste their time. Um, so I, I would I would avoid shoehorning uh, as well. I think that that's right on. Fabulous. Well, I have already launched our last poll for the day. We would love to get your feedback um, to help make these even better going into the future. I see that already 60% of you have responded and I'm really grateful for that. If we can get it up to 75, that'd be amazing. So go, 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 answer, answer, answer. Um, and while you're doing that, let me just take you through our final moments of today's event. First of all, a huge thanks to the whole team of experts who generously gave their time and expertise to participate and, and answer all of your questions. I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, the second thing is, yes, slides and videos will be coming at you real fast. Probably by Monday, you'll receive an email that will have all the key links um, so you can make sure that nothing that happened today is going to escape forever. You're going to have a chance to grab it back and relearn it. Um, and finally, when you close this Zoom today, a quick link is going to just pop up. And you're going to have our standard survey, which is a little bit different than this poll. Again, it's like three questions. We would love your input on that to help make these events even better. Um, but otherwise, with that, I'm grateful to everyone for all of their time. and. We do this three times a week, so stay tuned. We're really looking forward to connecting with you again and bringing more technology, fundraising, and communication solutions to you in the nonprofit sector. Thank you all. Such a pleasure. We'll see you soon. Bye, everyone.